speaker today, she has stories from all around the world, but today she is here to talk about the legends and lore of China. Um, she will not be standing here still reading from a note card like I am. She will be moving around all over the place, as I'm sure you've already been able to tell. Um, so please, if you're ready to be entertained and have a fun time, this is Rowan Judd. Thank you, thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Do you want to say hello? Hello, everybody. This is my friend Roan Judd, and I'm Few Chanel. <laughs> yes, I uh, have to have a nice last name if you're, some, if you're someone like me. Um, you're probably wondering what a skunk is doing up here, but uh, Miss, Miss Roan Judd is a, a rather shy person when she was little, and she started puppeteering long before she started storytelling, so I'm going to help her. Want to go? I do. You know what? Um, the story that we're going to tell to start out with is actually a Chinese story, but I have found it all over in Native American literature and folklore here in this country, um, which kind of makes me think maybe that land bridge did happen and that people did come across uh, through Mongolia to the land bridge and into and to Alaska, the Athabascans, and down. Now I know the Navajos actually came down from up there down into the southwestern part of the United States. Uh, so this is a story from both places, from Native America, different tribes in Native America, and from China. And the last time I told this story with few, <clears throat> we are going to do a warm, this is our warm-up story. Oh, uh, yeah. Don't have to warm up today, honey. No, that's true. <laughs> the last time we told this story, I wore the costume, and guess what? What? You promised you'd wear the costume this, today if we told the story here. I did? Yeah, you did. Did I really promise? You did. Well, huh, a promise is a promise and a deal is a deal, right? Right. Yeah. All right. Where is it? It's right here. <laughs> Don't laugh when I put it on. I don't know if I can do that. I might have to smile when you put that on. Don't laugh. <laughs> oh, they might have to smile too. Maybe a couple laughs. <laughs> A long time ago, did you all know that rabbits had tails as long as mine? Hey, wait a minute, are you serious about that? Hey, this is a legend. I'm allowed to stretch the truth as long as my tail. True. So they had tails this long. Yes, and they were tricksters. They used to like to trick the other animals. And one day, they were standing on their side of the, the Yellow River. They looked down, and there was no green grass to eat. But when they looked across the river... There was nice green grass on the other side, and they didn't have any boats, and they didn't know how to swim, so they decided to call the turtles. They yelled, turtles. You can do that too. Take in a breath. Turtles. Good. Once more. Turtles. And pretty soon, the biggest turtle of all, that's you. Oh, sorry popped its head out of the water and said, What do you want, rabbits? Well, we rabbits have been arguing. Oh, I hope you haven't been hurting each other. Oh, no, turtles. We've been having a friendly argument about what? About who has more children, we rabbits or you turtles? Oh, we turtles laid a lot of eggs this spring. We have many more children than you rabbits. Uh-uh. We rabbits breed like rabbits. <laughs> We have many more children than you turtles. How do we prove who has more kids? Said the turtles. And the rabbit said, we've thought of a way. Oh, yeah? What is that, turtles? Why don't you rabbits line all the way across the Yellow River, and we will count you, turtles. Turtles, line up. So that's exactly what they did. They lined up head to tail all the way across the Yellow River, jumping from turtle back to turtle back counting. One, two, three, four, and pretty soon they're up to 100, 200, 500, 1,000 turtles with backs like stepping stones and rabbits standing on top of them, jumping from one to the other. And the rabbits thought they'd really tricked those turtles, so they started to laugh. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. What are you rabbits laughing at, said the turtles. We don't care how many kids you have. 
We just wanted to use your backs like stepping stones to get all the way across the river so we could eat that nice green grass on the other side because we're hungry. And the turtle said, we're hungry too. <laughs> and guess what kind of turtles they were? They went, they went, snap, snap. You can do that too. Snap, 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 snap. Hey, wait a minute. We're the, tur we're the rabbits, the turtles, you're the rabbit. Oh, sorry, sorry. I get confused, so do I. Here we go. Snap, 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 and pretty soon snap, <coughs> snap, <coughs> snap. <coughs> Every rabbit, which once had a tail this long, snap, <coughs> now had a tail this long. And that, my friends, is how rabbits got very short tails. <laughs> you can clap now. <laughs> All right. Yeah, may I show them how I comb my hair? Yes, you may. I'm a punk skunk. Yes, you are. I'm not sure that's, I'm not sure that's Chinese, but you're a punk skunk. I'm going to put you back here because we have another story to tell you. Let me put this down here. Good night, everybody. Nighty night. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Good night. All right. I'm going to put this right here. That one was for, for you, from your, for your, uh, the youngsters in your life. This one is a very, very old Chinese story, probably about 1,500 years old by my research. And I first found it in the uh, Bloomfield Township Library in a book called Tales from a Taiwan Kitchen. And it goes like this. In every river, in every part of the world, there is a wall that divides the river in half lengthwise all the way down the river. Every single river. At least that's what my Chinese friends tell me. And on one side of that river, there are fish. And on the other side, there are <sighs> dragons. And the fish are always trying to get over those gates. Because if one fish can get over one of those gates in one of those rivers, that fish grows twice as tall as all the other dragons, and it has five toes on each paw. Its fins turn into dragon paws, and it turns into the king or queen of all the dragons. So the fish are always trying to get over the gate, and the dragons are very jealous of their power, and they're always trying to scare the fish away. And when they scare the fish away, they do it by stirring up the water on their side of the gate so that a current develops and it pushes the fish on the other side of the gate away from the gate. They go like this. So you can do that too. Try it with me. And if they do it enough, it starts to rain. At first it's a soft rain, so rub your pointers together. Then it's a harder rain. Rub your hands together. Then it's a harder rain. Clap your hands. Then it's a harder rain. And people standing by the river say, it's raining. It's raining. The dragons must be wrestling. No. The, say, it, say it with me. The dragons must be wrestling. <laughs> so one day, very near one of those gates, a mom fish swam up to the gate with her two children. And she said, oh, children. Don't swim too near the gate. You don't want to get over and become an old dragon now, do you? And that first little fish said, the fish was only about two. No, Mom, dragons scare me. I don't want to become a dragon. I'll stay away from the gate. But that second fish <laughs> was a teenager fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mom. <laughs> I want to swim near that gate. I want to get over that gate. I want to grow five toes on each paw, have a crown on my head, and rule all those dragons. And that mom thought, I could save a lot of college tuition here. <laughs> you know what? I think it's time for you to seek your fortune. You stay near the gate, and Junior and I here will swim away, and good luck to you. And they all gave each other fish hugs and kisses. And the mom swam away with the little one, and that teenager fish stayed right by the gate and said, Dragons! Do it with me. 
dragons again. <gasps> dragons! And pretty soon on the other side of the gate, the dragons started to wake up. They were, had all been sleeping. Who called us? And on the other side of the gate, that fish said, I, I, I c -c -c called you dragons. What do you want, you lowly little fish? Um, d -d dragons, m -m 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 may I jump over your gate today? And the dragon said, no, and do it with me, and went, brrr, 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 no, no, no. But not enough to make a rain, but enough to push that little fish into the reeds on its own side of the gate. Hmm. But you know what? That fish was a very brave fish, was not afraid of those dragons, and had something in mind, and was very determined. Watched the dragons through the reeds for a couple of days and learned two things about dragons. Number one, dragons are very vain. <gasps> they love to be told they're beautiful or handsome. And number two, dragons hate to be told they cannot do something. Even if they can't do it, they pretend that they can to save face. So knowing those two things about dragons, that fish swam up to the gate again and said, Dragons! Dragons! Now this fish was becoming famous. They had known that that fish was hiding in the reeds, and those dragons were starting to get their backs reared up and said, It's that lowly little fish again. What do you want, little fish? I'm going to... Before they could... That fish said, Wow! Huh? You are so gorgeous. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. You're right, little fish. What else do you like about us? You look so beautiful with the sun shining through the water refracting upon your blue, green, yellow, orange scales. I, it's so brilliant I can barely, barely look at it. And the males said, what about us? You are very strong. I guess it would be macho. I don't know what that is in Chinese. You are very strong. You think we're strong? What else do you like about us, little fish? Well, you're gorgeous. You're handsome. I can't believe how strong you look. Think. I had to think of something. Oh, I know. Uh, I, I've heard it said by and by that you dragons can fly. But do you know what? I haven't seen you try. Not once. So I think it's one big fat li Ooh, lie's too strong a word. It's a fib. You can't fly. The dragons didn't know whether they could or not, and they talked amongst themselves. Can we fly? I don't know. We better try. They turned to that fish and said, We can fly. <laughs> and that fish said, Haven't seen you try. We can fly. Haven't seen you try. We can fly. Haven't seen you try. We can fly. Haven't seen you try. And pretty soon they were going back and forth and back and forth. And finally the dragon said, we better try something. I don't know if we can fly or not, but put up your dragon arms. Here we go. Hundreds of dragons doing this, trying to figure out whether this could happen or not. Flutter, flutter. Flutter, flutter. Flutter, flutter. And pretty soon they were all doing it. Flutter, 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 flutter. <sighs> Hundreds of dragons, a thousand feet above the water. We can fly. Let's go really high. We didn't know we could fly. We tried, and now we know we can. We can fly, little fish. What do you think now? And that fish looked up and said, very impressive. And guess what that fish did while those dragons were way up there? 
right over the gate. Ah, did you see that? I got them to go up in the sky. They didn't know they could fly. They learned something about themselves in the bargain, and now I'm on the other side of the gate. How did that work out? Isn't that great? Am I not smart? And those dragons with their sharp dragon eyes looked at that fish, which was now on their side of the gate, and said, did you see that fish? It's splashdown time, dragons. That fish is on our side of the gate. Splush! What a splash it made. Hundreds and hundreds of dragons in the water. And the biggest dragon said, what do you think you have done now, little fish? You're on our side of the gate. What do you think you've done? And that fish said, well, I think I just managed to get you to go up in the air. You didn't know you could do that. And it was no longer a fin. It was a giant dragon paw with five toes on it. Oh, I said, I think I managed to get you to go up in the air. And, oh, oh, I'm twice as tall as any of you. And I've got a crown on my head. I said, I think I just managed to get you to go up in the sky. Look at you, you can fly. Look what you can do. Look what I can do. I rule you all. And those dragons looked up at that dragon and said, wanting to save face, of course. We wanted you to become a dragon the whole time anyway. <laughs> that dragon said, you did not. You can't admit I'm so smart and now I rule you all. You did not. We did too. You did not. We did too. You did not. We did too. And pretty soon they were laughing and wrestling. <laughs> did not, did too, did not. Do it with me. <laughs> Do it with me. <laughs> and it was enough to make it a soft rain. Then a harder rain. Then a harder rain. Then a harder rain. And the people standing by the river that day put up their nice lacquered Chinese umbrellas and said, It's raining. It's raining. The dragons must be wrestling. The dragons must be wrestling. And that, my friends, is the end of the story of how to become a dragon. <laughs> Okay, I'm glad you're finished with your tea and your cookies because this story is a rural story, a very rural story from China, old, 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 from one of the northern provinces. One of the, they call them the autonomous provinces where people, a lot of people are still nomadic. And some of them did settle and become more agrarian and this story comes, kind of comes out of that tradition of finally settling down. This happened in a lot of places, Ireland and um, different countries all over the world where people stopped wandering, planted themselves, and started planting. So there's going to be some stuff in here. If you're not a farmer, it's going to see a, seem a little what that we call kind of manure-y. <laughs> the terrible Nanguama is coming tonight to tear you to pieces and take a big bite. The terrible Nanguama, do it with me. The terrible Nanguama is coming tonight to tear you to pieces and take a big bite. Great, I love it. Chinese love firecrackers and all that stuff. As a matter of fact, they have firecrackers crackers to scare away the dragons. Now, what in the world is a Nanguama? A Nanguama is anything your mind can conjure up that, that goes bump in the night. The scary things, the things that keep you up and give you nightmares. Could be a... What could, the, what could it be? Think of animals and even mythical things. What could it be? A dragon. A dragon, yeah. <laughs> what else? Snakes. Snakes, a bear. Wolf. Anything else? A wolf? All rolled into one. All of those things all rolled into one. An indefinable, scary creature. But that's not the most scary thing about a Nanguama, is how it's made up of all these scary things. One of the most scary things about a Nanguama is the fact that you can smell it long before you can see it. It's not good. And when one is near, people go, 
Ooh. So do that with me. Ooh. But that's not the most terrible thing about a terrible nunguama. Another thing about a terrible nunguama is the fact that you can hear it long before you can see it. It has a really scary wind-up growl that goes like this. Ah! So do that with me. Ah! But that's not the most terrible thing about a terrible nunguama either. Another terrible thing about a terrible nunguama is the fact that it can squeeze into very small spaces. It can come through that doorway but it can expand as big as the room once it's in the room. And it usually enters the room feet first, and its feet are all floppy. They're made of like a cross between jello and green slime. And when they come through the door, they come through feet, feet, feet first like this. Flip! Flop! Flip! Flop! But that's not the most terrible thing about a terrible nunguama <laughs> either. <laughs> the most terrible thing about a terrible nunguama, the absolute scariest thing about a terrible nunguama is what nunguamas like to eat. Nunguamas love to eat. <laughs> Rice cakes. <laughs> Rice cakes. But they must ask permission of whomever made the rice cakes to eat them or they may not have them. And if they don't get them, the nanguama gets very angry and makes a promise to whomever has been asked for those rice cakes. You're not going to give me a rice cake, huh? Guess what's going to happen? Because you won't give me a rice cake. The terrible nanguama, do it with me, the terrible nanguama is coming tonight to tear you to pieces and take a big, yeah, 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 yeah. but, and here's where our story begins. <laughs> One day, a beautiful Chinese girl, an herbalist, an agrarian, a midwife, who was living independently of her parents, had grown up enough and wasn't married yet and just decided, maybe not at all, had all of her pots in the yard, it was before springtime, empty. She was going to fill them with seedlings. And she had just made rice cakes for her honorable parents. It was Chinese New Year, and there was a promise of spring in the air. Still some snow on the ground. And she started to walk into the village where her parents lived with these rice cakes carefully wrapped. She could smell crocuses popping up through the snow and the very promise of spring come early, when all of a sudden, ew, do it with me, ew, ew, and then she heard, ah, and then she heard, flip, flop, flip, flop, and there was a nunguama standing right in front of her and said, give me those rice cakes. She said, you may not have these rice cakes. I can give you half of one. The rest are for my honorable parents. I want them all. No, you may not have them. You may not have all of these. All right, then. If you won't give them all to me, the terrible nunguama is coming tonight to tear you to pieces and take a big bite. I don't care. I don't care, she said. And the nanguama went through the woods with those floppy feet, flip, flop, flip, flop. And when she couldn't hear the floppy feet, she could hear the wind-up growl. Ah! And when she couldn't hear the wind-up growl, she could smell that terrible smell. Ooh. <gasps> what have I done, she thought. The terrible nanguama is coming tonight to tear me to pieces and take a big bite. What have I done? She walked into the town square. The light was coming up. And people were gathering to sell their things for the day, and they looked at her, and she looked like a ghost. She was so afraid. What happened? I, I, I didn't give the nunguama all my rice cakes, and now the nunguama's coming tonight to tear me to pieces and take a big bite. And someone said, nunguamas don't lie. What are you going to do about it? And she said, I don't know. My mind is in a fog. I can't think of anything. And a man who sold manure in the town square for fertilizer said, Nanguamas are much more fastidious than you think. He took a pair of gloves 
And he reached into his manure bag and gave her a small bag of manure. And she said, what do I do with this? And he said, tonight, long before the Nanguama comes to your door, smear your door with manure. The Nanguama will come and try to get into your house, dirty its paws in the manure and get disgusted and go away. And an old woman who sold needles and threads and beautiful silk fabric said, oh, no, 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 you have to do this. I may be bent over from the rice fields, but I know a thing or two, young lady. Ow, ow! 24 needles? What do I do with these? Tonight, long before the Nanguama comes to your door, yes, put the manure on the door, but impale the door with the 24 needles. The Nanguama will come and pick itself on the 24 needles, dirty its paws in the manure, and I'll tell you what, it's that time of year. If the Nanguama is afraid at this point, the Nanguama will drop its skin and run away in fear. It's molting season. Someone else said, no, no, um, that's not enough. Um, uh, oh, here. He had a bag, and the bag was writhing with a life of its own. And he opened it up, and out of the bag, he pulled snakes that had been milked of their venom early in the morning. He was going to sell them in the town square to get rid of rats and venom in the garden. You need these more than anybody here. And he put them in a sack, tied it off, and gave it to her. And he said, tonight, long before the Nanguama comes to your door, yes, smear the manure on your door, impale the door with the 24 needles, but inside the door, remember, Nanguamas are very fastidious, put a bucket of water, put the snakes in the water, and let them swim around in the water. During the evening, they'll get their poison back, and their fangs will get sharper and the Nanguama will come and pick itself on the 24 needles, dirty its paws in the manure, open your door, see the snakes in there, oh, for sure, will lose its skin and run away. Someone else said, no, 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 you need more insurance than that. And this person had a big bag of salt water that had been waxed, the outside had been waxed to hold the salt water, and inside were fish, very much like piranha, big teeth. Take these, put them on your hearth tonight in a, in a pan of water. Just let the water get tepid like bath water. You don't want to kill the fish. The Nanguama will come, pick itself on the 24, Needle. dirty its paws in the door. open the door and wash its paws in the pot inside the door that has the snakes. And if it hasn't shed its skin and run by then, it'll see that pot of water on the stove to soothe its paws if it's been bitten by a snake. It probably won't kill it. Nanguamas are pretty tough. Might, might scare it, but if it's not scared, it'll go to soothe its paws in that pot of tepid water on the hearth. The fish will bite it, it'll drop its skin, it'll go away, and somebody said, no, 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 um, you need more insurance than that. This person had many, many hens and sold eggs in the town square every day, handed her a bunch of eggs, and she said, what do I do with these? Aha, uh -huh. now guamas are smart. They know Chinese medicine. This is really true, even in rural China now. If you are bleeding or you cut yourself shaving, you can take sterilized ashes from the fire. Styptic. Remember that? The Nanguama will come and pick itself on the 24, dirty its paws in the, wash its paws in the pot outside the, in the door that has the, watch it paws in the hearth pan that has the, and that Nanguama will be hurting by now and it will know Chinese medicine and will stick its paws in the ashes. But before you do anything tonight, put eggs at the edge of the fire. And if the fates are with you, as soon as that Nanguama goes to put its hands in those ashes, those eggs will pop, temporarily blind the Nanguama, and the Nanguama will be afraid, drop its skin, find its way out of the house and go away. And somebody else said one more thing. There was a man who had a grind wheel, a big wheel with a hole in it, that he rigged on some metal housings and used to grind things and sharpen things. And he said, I'm going to sell this anyway. Take this home, put a rope through the hole, throw it up over the rafters above your bed, tie it off on the cleat where you usually tie off your curtains. The Nanguama will come, pick itself on the 24 needles, dirty, dirty its paws in the, wash its paws in the pot inside the door that has the, wash its paws in the pot contains the paws in the ashes where the
but Nanguamas have a great sense of smell, and if it hasn't been scared out of its skin by then, it'll start coming toward you. Make sure you have your kitchen knife on your bed. And when that Nanguama leans over to take a bite out of you, start sawing that line that holds that grindstone above your bed. Make sure it gets threadbare and breaks, boom! For sure, it will scare that Nanguama away, it'll scare it out of its skin, and you'll be home free. So here she is with all this stuff. She says, how do I get this home? The man says, no problem. Keep the wheelbarrow, keep the grindstone. Everybody starts piling all the things they gave her into the wheelbarrow, and they help her get it home with all these things, all of these little weapons against the Nanguama. The first thing they do, as a crowd, huge crowd of Chinese friends, now they're friends, <laughs> throw a rope up over the rafters and hoist that grindstone, tie it off on the cleat that usually holds the curtain string, go to the kitchen, put a knife on the bed, go to the edge of the hearth, and in the ashes put the, in the pot on top of the hearth, put the, in the pot inside the door, put the, she reaches into the bag of, smears the door with a manure and impales the door with a 24. Yeah. And it's starting to get dark. And mist is starting ri to rise up from the ground because it's been a warm winter day and now it's getting cold. And pretty soon she can't see her own hand in front of her face. And she can barely see her friends disappearing through the mist to their homes for the evening, wishing her well. Good fortune be with you. She says, thank you, friends. Thank you. And she sits on the bed with her hand on that kitchen knife, and waits. 10 o'clock, she hears from the town square, all is well. She feels a little sleepy at about 11. 11 o'clock, thieves stay away from our doors. But all of a sudden, just as she's nodding off, ew, ew. And then she hears, ah, 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 and then she hears, flip, flop, flip, flop. <laughs> this is her house. Look at this gorgeous door. <laughs> Look at all those pots in the yard. Yes, this is the herbalist. This is the one who wouldn't give me any rice cakes. He goes to push the door open. Ow, oh, oh. <laughs> 24 needles. <laughs> she doesn't know how strong and macho I am. I'll just push the door open. How convenient. A pot of water for me to wash my hands before I gobble her up. Oh, 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 oh. mommy, mommy. Oh, oh, look at I know Chinese medicine. There's a pot on the on the hearth. I bet that water's nice and warm. I'll put my paws in there. Ah, yes, I'm a smart nanguama. Oh, 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 fish, mean fish, mommy, mommy. Oh, I. She doesn't know how smart I am. Uh, I know Chinese medicine. Ah. Uh, I have boo-boos, I'll just put them in the ashes. Hmm. She doesn't know how smart I am. <laughs> Eggs, mm, she even fed me. <sighs> All right, where is she? I can smell her back there. Flip, flop, flip. Flop. He leans over the bed, and that stinking Nanguama breath just goes, ooh, she can see his shadow. He's gotten small enough to fit in her room. And she reaches down and starts to saw that line that holds the grindstone as quietly as she can. Nanguama was gone, gone, gone. <laughs> and there she was holding the Nanguama skin. She was an herbalist. She made medicines, perfumes, and things to sell in the town square. And she knew something 
about Nanguama's molted skins. She took the fish out of the pot on the hearth, she put fresh water in, and she put that Nanguama skin into the pot and cooked it down and cooked it down and cooked it down until it became what looked like Nanguama sludge, <laughs> but it was patchouli perfume. That's what happens to a Nanguama skin when you boil it down. She looked at all the pots in her yard. She put them all in the wheelbarrow, and she put this patchouli in these pots, hundreds of little pots, took some tallow and some candle wax and sealed the tops of the pots so the scent would stay in the pots. Some of them were really tiny like this, and she knew even if somebody owned this big a little vial of patchouli, that a Nanguama would never come to their door. Safeguard. She wheeled the wheelbarrow into the town square with all of her pots of perfume, and people's mouths dropped open. They said, is that what I think it is? And she said, Nanguama perfume. I will give you 100 yen for a bottle. I'll give you 1,000 yen. I'll give you 20 yen. I'll give you, uh, pretty soon she's selling bottle and bottle and bottle of patchouli until she has two left. One to put by her door and one for her honorable parents to put by their door. And then she takes that money and she gives some to those people over there that lost all of their rice fields in a drought last year. She takes some more money. These people had a fire in their houses, and she gives them money to rebuild their houses. And pretty soon she's giving away what she just got until she has just a few yen, and then she gives it to someone for the ingredients for rice cakes, <laughs> <laughs> which she goes home and makes fresh again and takes to her honorable parents. <laughs> That's the end. <laughs> All right. I have here, oh yay. I'm gonna get another friend out here. Um, I have to be honest with you, I don't know what dog or coyote-like creatures there are in Japan. <laughs> or China. We're in China, aren't we? Yes, we are. This is Chipotle, Chipper. Um, and he's going to tell you a Chinese story with me. You going to do that? Yes, I will. Yeah. Long time ago, a Chinese angel... Oh, we have a disclaimer. Oh, that's right, that's right. Yes, we have a disclaimer. Our disclaimer is we may tell creation stories and we may tell stories about other people's beliefs, but we, we tell them as stories. We're not asking you to believe them. A Chinese angel decided to visit hell, went down there, and there were long, long banquet tables, and there were every, every Chinese dish on these tables you could ever imagine that you would Name some Chinese dishes you like. What do you like? Oh, I love chow mein. What else? Chop suey. Ah, I like mugu gai pan. What do you like? Oh, well, I know what somebody over there likes. That gray-haired guy loves fish and black bean sauce. Yeah. And you like, I like sautéed uh, pea pod greens with garlic. I'm glad you didn't have any before you came here. <laughs> anyway, when the angel looked and saw that banquet table full of beautiful things, the angel also saw people sitting on both sides of the table that looked very, very unhappy. Very unhappy, yes. You know why? Why? Because they had chopsticks five feet long and they couldn't eat any of that good food. So the angel thought, hmm, if this is hell, what would heaven be? I think I'll go visit heaven. And the angel went up to heaven and... There were banquet tables all over the place with every good Chinese dish you could ever think to eat. Wonderful things, even some of the really special sweets that they have. And the people were sitting across from each other at the tables laughing, sharing stories, telling each other how they were going to help them build houses, how they were going to help each other do this and that, how they were going to help and give an acupuncture trade for some garden work, and laughing and clinking glasses and having a great time, and the food was plentiful. 
and the chopsticks were also five feet long. But they were feeding each other across the table. One person's heaven is another person's hell, I guess. I don't know. You can clap now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. We told you a tale about a tale. We're going to end with a tale about a tale. Um, did you know that a long time ago, this is, uh, this is not a Chinese story, but I do like ending with this. Is that okay, Stephanie? All right. Uh, did you all know that a long time ago, dogs could sing? Yeah? They sang like this. Yeah? You can do it with me if you want, too. And they also could dance. They went like this. <laughs> they loved to sing and dance at the same time, and it looked and sounded like this. <laughs> they could really cut a rug. But you know what? Their tails always got in the way. So they would have to unscrew their tails. Oh, I'll do that for you. And hang them up on a pole where bags of rice were drying. And then they could sing and dance because their tails didn't get in the way. But one night they were singing and dancing. They had taken their tails off and suddenly they heard a big growl. They didn't know if it was a bear or a nunguama or what. They took in a deep breath. You can do, do it with me. We're going to take a deep breath and do a big growl. Here we go. Wait, once more. And pretty soon, every dog grabbed any tail they could find and ran out of that rice paddy. Any tail they could find. And to this day, guess what? What is the first thing one dog does when it meets another dog? They sniff each other's tails. Do you know why, Miss Pat Rone Judd? No. Well, that day when they, when they took those tails, every single dog took the wrong one. And today, they're still looking for their own tails because they want them back. <laughs> and that, my friends, is why dogs sniff. You can clap now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we can take a few questions. Do we have time to do that? Yeah. Um, I'd love to take some questions from you about how I got into this and um, how you might tell, better tell stories to your, your loved ones and the people in your life. So let's do some questions. Want to help me? Yes. How did you get into it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I got into it pretty, pretty young. Um, I, I've been kind of an amateur puppeteer since I was in first or second grade, and I used to sit on the floor with my brother and puppeteer and make up stories with him. But then one day in second grade, I, it was either second or third, I think it was third grade, Miss Willits in Redford, uh, I went to Redford Union Schools. Um, she asked us to write a fairy tale, and I did. It was around Christmas time, and it was kind of sad. And she liked it so much, she asked me to get up in front of the whole school during the, the assembly, the Christmas assembly, and tell the story. So I put my paper on the podium, and I started to tell the story. And then all of a sudden, pretty soon, I wasn't reading off my paper. I've always had kind of safety nets, like a puppet in front of me to ease my way into something, a piece of paper in front of me. But I put the paper down, and pretty soon I was at the edge of the stage telling the story as I remembered it on that paper. And when I got back to the classroom, I was very sullen and quiet, and Mrs. Uh, Will Miss Willett said, Pat, what's the matter with you? My name's Pat Roan Judd. What is the matter with you? You told a great story, and I said, I lied. She said, what do you mean? I said, I didn't tell what was on my paper. I lied. I, I, I wrote that story, and I just stood at the edge of the stage, and I lied. And she said, no, you didn't. You wrote a second draft. <laughs> and she was, just, she was just a fabulous woman. She was a fabulous woman. Um, I traveled as a white-faced pantomime for years. I taught high school for almost two years in an alternative program. And our funding was discontinued, was uh, cut off for the program. And I'd been performing all along anyway, and I just kind of worked my way into always performing. And um, I just, it, it evolved. I, I was in a mime company, and I did white-faced pantomime shows for years. My brother performed with me. And we went back to that third grade teacher and performed for the whole school. More than 20 years after, yeah, he, had, he had gone to school there. And 
eventually I went to a workshop in Maine and a storyteller named Tony Montanero, I mean, uh, he's actually, it was actually a mime. I studied with Marcel Marceau briefly too. But I really liked him because he had a very expansive idea of what performing is. And he said, you know, you have a good voice and you love puppets. Why don't you incorporate some of the other things you do into, into your act? And I said, but it's not white-faced pantomime. And he said, I am not a purist. <laughs> Go and work on something and then come back a couple of years from now and I'll help you work through some of the stuff. And I took, I think I ended up taking three workshops with him in Maine. And that's how I ended up doing it. So that's how, really how I ended up being a storyteller. I'm really uh, not a, a, a hyper-social person. I, I'm kind of on the shy side uh, when I first meet somebody. And this is just my way of not being shy, I guess, for a while. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Um, I, I use public domain material, basically. I asked Ed Young for permission to tell the terrible Nanguama. Ed Young wrote Lan Popo the Chinese Little Red Riding Hood. And he also illustrated, and I say re retold because these are old stories. Nobody really owns these stories. But when you write a book and illustrate it, you own what you've said in that book, and you own your drawings and paintings. And he's a wonderful painter. But I do, I do write some of them of my own. And the public domain stuff is slowly, and this is very sad, <coughs> with the digital age is slowly disappearing from libraries because books are disappearing. Mm -hmm. But now I'm getting a little more internet savvy, so I, I'll get on. Do you remember the red fairy book, the orange fairy book, the blue fairy book, the pink fairy book that was on the shelves in libraries? I have almost all of those on my shelf, but now they're digitizing all of this, these things. So that's basically what I do. And when I read a story, if it doesn't move me, literally move me, if I don't feel any movement possibilities, I, I just can't do it. I, I, can't, I can't stand still. I don't read stories. I don't stand in one place and tell stories. You get into it. Yeah. <laughs> <You're home. laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, do you find that the same story concepts come from different cultures? Absolutely. Just like uh, the rabbits and the turtles. I mean, if you are familiar with how and why Native American stories, doesn't that sound like a, a yeah. Michigan Native American story to you? Well, I found it in a book of Chinese stories. And then I found it again, and it's a, another version in Native, Native Ameri American uh, legends. It's just amazing how similar things are. There, there's supposed to be something like um, 700 versions of Little Red Riding Hood around the world. Oh, wow. Cautionary tales, you know? These are the things we told people to keep, it was like, you know, stranger danger. It was their version of stranger danger. You know, watch it when you go, oh, you know, don't just talk to anybody out there. Um, and Cinderella as well, lots of versions of Cinderella. And some of them are not the princess being taken care of by the prince, but the princess saving the prince. Oh, wow. And proving her worth as a very strong person. And the prince becomes very attracted to her as a result. So the, a lot of these things are not traditional Western uh, stories. Uh, surprisingly enough, Celtic folklore, Native American folklore, and Chinese folklore have very strong women, very strong. And sometimes you think of the cultures and you go, hmm, you know, that's not what I learned, that's not what I thought of when I was growing up. You know, everybody thought of, you know, women following behind men, and, but their stories have very strong women in them. And, uh, yeah, any other questions? Yes. Pardon me? I do, and the man who made my puppets also made this beautiful tr uh, quilted tree of life. Um, his name is Russ Gordonier. He made few. I have a couple of other things made by him, too, but I love Chipotle and few. They're my two favorites. My, um, my husband's back there videotaping the guy with the gray hair, and this is our friend Dan from the city taping. But my husband uh, and I uh, had a son, have a son named Liam. He's 30 now, and he's dyslexic. And I would, few was my first puppet for storytelling. And I would sit in bed when he wasn't tracking. I noticed he wasn't tracking left to right when he was reading. So I'd sit in bed with Few and have him, I'd, I'd hold a book and Few would read while I was reading to Liam. And pretty soon I couldn't get in bed to read to Liam without Liam going, go get Few. Few needs to hear the story too. So I, it got him interested in the written word, I hope. Uh, he seems like he's reading a lot more even now. Yeah. Not a sign of no intelligence. No. 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 Uh, too smart. <laughs> Anybody else? 
thank you very much for coming today. And thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much. And thank you, Troy Historic Center. It's, what, what's the official name? Troy Historic Village. Troy Historic Village. Give them a hand for this lovely tea and all the legwork. Thank you.